Hi, film addicts. Welcome to the show. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Today, we have a very special guest, David Helfant. David is the president and CEO of Arpeggio Entertainment, where he produces and manages musical clients and actors that are world famous. David is the chairman of the board for the Guitar Center Music Foundation, and David is a lawyer representing world famous clients like the Troubadour. David was also on the Board of Governors for the Recording Academy for 12 years. We're so lucky to have David on the show today. David, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's really fun. <laughs> Great. And David, where are we recording you live from today in the world? I am in Los Angeles, California. All right, and we're having a beautiful uh, Valentine's Saturday in Los Angeles. And um, I wanted to ask you, you have a really terrific name for your company, Arpeggio. What does Arpeggio mean? Arpeggio is a series of musical notes that get strung together to accentuate the melody from a song. Oh, I love that because you have so many musical Clients. Oh, I can't wait till we start talking about your um, clients like, oh, Mac recording artist Val Garay, the immediate family, Neil Schoen from Journey. But OK, so we'll save that for um, further. But I want to ask you, um, at, uh, David, when growing up, what was one of your favorite films as a kid? Well, I think one of the films that impacted me the most growing up was West Side Story. And I think it was because. It had elements of everything that I love, dancing, singing, acting. Uh, I grew up in New York, so it took place on the streets of New York with the Jets and the Sharks fighting with each other. So it, it felt like the perfect film. You know, it was cast perfectly, the lighting, the art design. I mean, everything about the movie, the music, it just resonated with me in a very special way. Oh, uh, yeah, that's such a great film. I loved it, too. Uh, and, and also, uh, what you know, what was one of your favorite Criterion movies that inspired you to be this amazing producer that you are? You know, I have different films that I think of when I'm talking about different types of movies. Uh, you know, clearly, like a movie like The Birds, directed by Alfred Hitchcock had a tremendous impact on me. Um, Avatar, you know, James Cameron, which was obviously a newer film. Uh, Spartacus had a tremendous impact upon me growing up. El Cid. So these were all uh, great movies by great directors that impacted my life. Oh, I love those movies. And, um, you know, you're a producer, so, I'm, I, you know, some of your, what would say, one of your favorite directors and a favorite film shot from a movie that you just love? Well, I think there's a few different directors that come to mind. Like, um, I love George Lucas. I think what he did with the Star Wars um, um, uh, series was amazing. And I was lucky enough, I actually worked with George a little bit on Return of the Jedi, which was fun. Oh my gosh, um, really? Oh, wow. Um, Spielberg, amazing director, had a great sensibility for action, but also emotion at the same time. Um, when I think about political films, Oliver Stone has a tr had a tremendous impact on being able to tell a story that had a political bend to it. Um, Woody Allen, if you're talking about dysfunctional love relationships. <laughs> so I, I think of different directors for different types of movies. And then on the horror action side, Ridley Scott is brilliant. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, so I want to ask you, you do a lot of things. Arpaggio Entertainment is a production company and also a personal management firm. So Correct. how did this all start? And can you tell us, like, you know, uh, you represented the actor Jennifer Love Hewitt, which everyone loves, musical I icon Neil Schoen from Journey, American Idol season finalist Jason Castro, 
Mac Avenue recording artist, Val Garay, the immediate family. And then also you're a lawyer and you represent Columbia Pictures, Sony Pictures, the Walt Disney Picture, uh, the Walt Disney Company, Paramount Pictures, Doug Weston's Troubadour, and you also represent icons like guitarist Slash, Van Halen, Teddy Pendergrass, Alice Cooper, just to name a few. So, how did this all start? Well, I uh, started playing guitar when I was eight years old. How nice! And, uh, I think I, much like many people, I was. Uh, home watching Ed Sullivan and the Beatles came on TV and it changed my life. And I said, that's what I want to do. <laughs> and I embarked on a journey thinking I was going to be the next Jimi Hendrix or Eric Clapton. And I played in a whole bunch of bands and decided that it made more sense for me to go into the business side of the entertainment industry rather than trying to be a performer. So I grew up in New York. I moved out to LA to go to law school. And lucky I got a job after I graduated school and kind of the rest is history. Oh my gosh, the rest. Well, can you tell us like um how you went from musical like how did you find your first musical talent? Like who did you sign? Well, um actually when I first started in the business, my uh, boss at the time was a guy by the name of Henry Bushkin, and his biggest client was Johnny Carson. Oh, my so gosh. At, at 25 years old, I was introduced to Johnny. Uh, the firm represented John Travolta, Bellucci and Aykroyd, Van Halen, Ozzy Osbourne, Cheap Tricks, Steppenwolf, The Kinks, David Letterman, Joan Rivers. So at 25 years old, I was thrust into the Hollywood limelight and I was pinching myself because it was something I had always dreamt about doing. And I was lucky enough to get a job that allowed me to work with these incredible artists. Oh, my gosh. So you worked for your boss and then you when did you decide to start your own company? Like, how did that come about? Well, the part of the reason why I got involved in management, um, Henry was managing Johnny as well as being his lawyer. And I was always intrigued by the idea of management. So I worked at the Bushkin firm for about four years. And then I left and I started my own law firm and my own management company. And um, so what, who was one of your first acting clients? Was that Jennifer Love Hewitt? Yeah, she was definitely one of the first. I, I also managed Cy Richardson, who was an actor and a singer who, you know, worked in a number of films. I had a few uh, bands that I was representing at the time and uh, started getting involved in record production, and video production. And over time, I guess what I realized was as the music business became more and more challenging, and the sale of recorded music was going down, what I realized was that every film and TV production had music in it. And so the idea of being able to segue into doing more film and TV made sense for me because there was music in every production. And so I found my way ultimately to becoming head of business and legal affairs for the music department at Paramount Pictures and uh, worked on a number of films when I was at Paramount. Oh, that's amazing. Um, what were some of your memorable films that you worked on? Because you have so many. You've done over 300. You've executive produced or been on over 300 TV and films. So is there some favorites that you, um, you can tell us about? <clears throat> well, one of the films that I really enjoyed working on when I was at Paramount was School of Rock starring Jack Black. Oh. And it's an example of a film that has, as, as one of the principal characters in the film, the music in that movie is as much a character as any of the actors. And so I was involved in helping to put the all the music together for the films, doing all the clearances, getting the soundtrack album, so one of the things that always struck me as interesting about that film, when we were making the movie, um, the director um, wanted to um, 
uh, used some songs from Led Zeppelin. And Led Zeppelin was infamous for not licensing its music for film and TV. And so what happened was, I don't know if you guys remember at that very end of the movie, the kids are in a talent competition and they perform um, at this theater. And what happened was Jack Black came up with the idea that he was going to do a special video message to Jimmy Page and Robert Plant when we were filming that scene. <laughs> and so he, so he basically did an invite where he said, guys, I know that you never give your music out for film and TV, but I'm such a huge Led Zeppelin fan and your music would be such an important part of the film. You know, would you please, 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 um, you know, give us the right to use the film. So we sent them the, a clip from the movie along with the clip from Jack Black. And they thought it was so adorable that they actually gave us the right to use their music in the film. And so that became such an important part of the film that when we put the DVD out in the special feature section, we actually put that little video piece that Jack had done for Robert and Jimmy as one of the special features for the film. That's so amazing. And speaking of rock, are you represent some of the the most uh, you know famous rock uh, musicians in the world, like Alice Cooper, Van Halen, and even Slash. So, how do you feel about um, where rock is right now? Because people are trying to revitalize rock. You're like, and a lot of, we're we're losing some of our best rock um, you know musicians. So. You know, what do you think? Is that ever going to become, you know, come back again? Or do we just have to savor and just, you know, enjoy these legends mu music? Well, I think what happens in the music business is everything is cyclical. Um, there are times in, you know, the history of recorded music where rock is more prevalent. There have been times when folk has been more prevalent. There have been times when jazz has been more prevalent. Right now, it's rap and hip hop. Um, but I think that the genres don't go away. They end up becoming more influential or less influential in certain parts in music history. But I think there will always be a place for rock, the same way that there'll always be a place for jazz and hip hop and soul and R&B and funk and, you know, a different um, um, you know, genres end up emerging as music grows. Like, for example, with hip hop and rap, there's a lot of samples that get used. And so, the, you know, a hip hop artist could sample a great rock lick and incorporate it into their music. So it's the blending of all these genres that come up with, you know, n new music and new approaches. Amazing. And so um, during, before the pandemic, you actually produced a movie. Can you tell us about Sophie's Love? And that was released on Christmas Day on Amazon, right? Yeah, I, I, did, I wasn't the producer of the film. I got brought into the film to work on some of the music. But it's a beautiful film. It's a great love story about a jazz saxophone player that falls in love with a girl whose father owns a record store in Manhattan. And she's dreaming of becoming a, film, a TV producer. And he's dreaming of being a famous recording artist. It's all about their relationship. But the music has a real incredible uh, part of the film. And it's gotten rave reviews. It was uh, acquired by Amazon Prime. And uh, it's done really well. And, you know, I, I'm very proud of the work that I did in the film. I wish that I was one of the producers. I did not produce that film, but the producers did an amazing job with the film. Oh, yeah. So I'm sorry, you did the musical producing in it, correct? And I worked on all the, the clearances for the music stuff. You know, the publishing, the soundtrack album, uh, working on finalizing the composer deal, getting all the rights together for all of that stuff. Oh, okay, okay, great. Because uh, I saw that, and uh, I just thought it was a beautiful film as well. And yes. uh, yeah, so, during COVID, how did COVID affect your art? 
um, were you doing, were you working on projects during COVID? Yeah, I have been working on a lot of different projects. I mean, one of the things about COVID is that it's changed the importance of certain platforms. You know, when a motion picture was released five, 10 years ago, the premier uh, way to launch a film was in theaters. And because theaters have been closed now for the last year, um, all of a sudden streaming platforms have become the primary way to launch a film or for that matter, a television series. And so now all of a sudden the shift has gone from, you know, a opening weekend of a theatrical release to now, you know, what are you number one on streaming uh, lists rather than theatrical uh, uh, lists. So, you know, the, the model has changed dramatically. It's also resulted in, you know, uh, buyers looking for different kinds of projects now. Absolutely. And um, so you've been working on, can you tell us about the documentary that you're working on with uh, Warner Music Group about, you know, world-renowned Troubadour nightclub in West Hollywood? Well, I've been, I've been representing the Troubadour for 35 years. And uh, I, about six years ago, embarked upon a journey to try and put um, some projects together for the Troubadour. One of the projects that's materialized really recently is I'm in pre-production on a music documentary about the history of the Troubadour. So we've acquired footage, we're doing interviews. We have um, some very special footage that no one's ever seen before of Doug Weston, the founder of the Troubadour, talking about the formation of the club and his career and experiences he had with bringing everybody from Elton John to Steve Martin to, um, you know, Cher, whoever it happens to be, to the Troubadour. I mean, people like James Taylor were discovered there and Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstadt, Crosby, Stills and Nash, the Eagles. I mean, it was really a, um, a home to discover incredible artists in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and even today. So that legacy I'm trying to preserve in a music documentary, which I think will be really interesting for people. Oh, yeah. And I think that um, people would love to be able to go back to concerts and go see the music concerts and dance and have fun and just experience the joy of uh, music and, and hearing it live instead of on the radio or your 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 um, earphones. I also want to just tell um, let people know that you also are the executive producers for Smooch Music. Hey, um, Smooch, I like that because I've got a kids book called Adventures of Mooch the Pooch. So Smooch, Mooch, and Pooch. We love those those kind of names. <laughs> so can you tell us about that? Because um, sure. So uh, many years ago, I was approached by Smooch to help them. They were putting a record together with Maya Angelou who is, you know, one of the most brilliant poets in um, American history. And she's not really known as being a singer or a recording artist, but we, Sean Rivera had come up with the idea of taking her spoken word poetry and putting it to music. So I got hired to work on putting the deals together, overseeing the production, you know, uh, securing distribution, working with the sales and marketing people and radio promotion teams. So six years ago, we launched a record called Cage Bird Songs, which was the last project that Maya Angelou did before she passed away. And as a result of the civil rights protests that occurred in the country last year, we decided to re-release the record and come up with a new music video. So the video premiered Thursday on rollingstone.com. And then on Friday, we re-released the record and a deluxe edition of the record in honor of Black History Month. And it's a, a beautiful piece of product. It's something that people should check out. And the video is amazing. It's you know got footage from all of the civil rights protests that took place last year 
juxtaposed against the iconic lyrics of Maya Angelou and bringing the world together through her poetry. Well, that's, that is just so beautiful. And you yeah. just do so many amazing things. And also you have another project, um, rock star and Sean Rivera of the as yet on La Face Records. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because you executive produced that and it was on the. Well, that, that was the same project. So Sean used to be in a band called As Yet, which okay. was signed to Arista Records. So he came up with the idea of making this Maya Angelo record. And then his band actually performed on one of the songs. And then Rockstar came in and produced uh, with Sean on the tracks as well. So we had a great um, think tank of writers and producers that worked with us on the record. And it came out great. And, and you said um, the Harlem Hopscotch, um, you, you executive produced that, right? And it's on, it was on Oprah's network, own network on that one? Well, yeah, well, that, that's, that was one of the songs on the record. And we decided that we were going to come up with a dance called the Harlem Hopscotch. And so we hired Nappy Tabs, who are a husband and wife team who are very famous choreographers. And uh, they had just finished doing one of the most successful music videos for Ed Sharon. So we partnered with Nappy Tabs. They choreographed the dance steps and uh, directed the music video. And I executive produced the video with uh, the OWN Network, which is Oprah's network. And the video premiered on OWN. And uh, it's, it's a really fun piece that has a whole bunch of celebrities in it and uh it, it was a nice way to introduce the album to the world oh and there, there's you have just so many things that i'm trying to let everyone know how fantastic you are and i don't even know when you sleep because from lawyer to producing uh to uh managing time talent you um you were the music supervisor for Choco Pictures, The Call, starring Halle Berry and Abigail right. Resden. I mean, there's just it just goes on and on and on. But I wanted to see, can um David, is there anything you'd like to tell us that's coming up for you that you're working on, or direct us to see something fabulous that you just love that you that you produced? Um, I you know I have a few projects that I'm working on right now. One of the ones that I think is going to be really fun is. Um, I manage a band called The Immediate Family with Fred Crochelle. And The Immediate Family is comprised of some of the greatest rock studio musicians of the last 50 years. You've got Russ Conkel on drums, Lee Sklar on bass, Wadi Wachtel on guitar, Danny Korchmar, and Steve Postel. And we have been working on a documentary on the history of the band with Denny Tedesco, who directed the Wrecking Crew documentary. And we already have interviews in the can from people like Linda Ronstadt, Carol King, James Taylor, Jackson Brown, David Crosby, Neil Young. And it's going to be an amazing documentary. It'll come out at the end of this year or beginning of next year. And it chronicles the incredible legacy of this band, much like uh, the Wrecking Crew were a very famous studio band in the uh, 60s. Uh, the immediate family was basically the wrecking crew of rock and roll in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. And uh, they played on six, 7,000 records, um, such as, you know, Carol King's Tapestry is a, a great example where we just, this year is the 50th anniversary of Tapestry. And a few of the guys from the band played on that record. And, you know, their history is iconic. And so I think that that documentary will be really well received by the public. Uh, sounds amazing. It's called The Immediate Family. Now, do you know where it's streaming yet? Um, so we can direct uh, the audience to go it, find it? It hasn't been, hasn't been sold yet. We're still in production. Okay. So uh, later in, in the year, we'll have a much better idea. And, I'm sure there'll be a whole bunch of press releases that'll come out. Okay, and it's called The Immediate Family. Is that going to be the name of it, or it might have a different oh, title? No, I don't know exactly what the title is going to be of the documentary yet. 
Oh, it sounds amazing. And um, so many people were going to want to see that because rock and roll legends in there, like you said, studio um, recording artists. So, um, yeah. And um, so, David, like, how is there anything you do for fun? Because you're working all the time. <laughs> Everything I do is fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you do. Yeah, and um, so uh, well, what... I I feel very fortunate because I can actually wake up in the morning and say I love what I do and I'm excited to go to work and I never know what's going to be thrown at me on any given day and I feel lucky that I actually could get paid for doing something that I love to do. Uh, and and your your career is just fantastic and i Thank can you. i can also see that we need to make a movie about, about <laughs> david helfet oh my god <laughs> yeah and um so uh, yeah and where can we direct the listeners to go you know support your work or see some of the stuff is there any social media or um a website or anything where they can just kind of just keep in touch up, up up to date with what you're working on well i have a website called uh uh, healthfantlaw.com and if you go there it talks about my projects you've got videos of me talking about my career and you can definitely find out about my upcoming projects at that website as well I agree and then um, do you still look for talent do you ever you know um, do you look like on the social media say if you listen to YouTube or snap uh, or every <laughs> every day TikTok uh Okay. Do you hear that, fans? TikTok, TikTok. So you know, keep keep working on your craft because you never know if you're scouted it's, by someone. It's, it's the new A and R gem. <laughs> TikTok. So you highly recommend TikTok. Do you hear that? You heard that here that David could be scouting TikTok for the next superstar recording artist or even talent, right? Acting talent. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, great. And uh, I just, David, it's amazing to have you on the show. You're just. Thank you. Fantastic. And I'm glad to have you on the show today. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And thanks everyone for listening. Until next week, um, be safe and have make every day a fantastic day. Bye, there everybody. <laughs>